Father God, I do thank you, Lord, this morning. Lord, I do need your help this morning to get this accomplished the way you want it done. Lord, we're going to go into a beautiful thing here. And I, I hear what you are saying, and I really want us to be prepared. And I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We're still talking about the Holy Spirit. Now, last week we started with talking about some inside influences and how, how the anointing functions. Now, we started talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we went in talking about the indwelling. What in the world is the indwelling? Okay, we started with the baptism. But the person, when they get saved, they get the Holy Spirit living within them. That's the indwelling. Then they come to the, Holy, the Lord and say, I need more help out. And that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does, is it, it gets you out. But the baptism has always been what we've called, people who were baptized in the Holy Spirit were called Spirit-filled. Well, that's a problem, because that's not the same. The filling of the Holy Spirit, we have dis determined, is a whole different thing. And now, I'm seeing it in everything I do. Everything that comes around, I'm just like, oh man, we should have seen this before. The filling of the Holy Spirit is a whole different thing than the baptism. A person can be filled with the Spirit and not be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And a person can be baptized in the Holy Spirit and not necessarily filled. That's a real interesting deal. How's that work? Well, then last week we started talking about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now we're just... So this is really a college class on the Holy Spirit. This is pneumatology. That's what they call that. The study of the Spirit. So pneumatology, here you are. You guys are doing a full college crash course on, on what the Holy Spirit is. How fun. Ain't it fun? Yeah. Well, there's one baptism, one indwelling. You don't need to do it again after that. However, many fillings are needed. Filling after filling after filling after filling after filling after filling. How many? Well, some days, <laughs> seems like it's a constant problem. How do we make the anointing work after that? Okay, what, how's this all fit together? Learning to flow with all of this together. Okay, here we go. This is the part that I'm going to have to go real quick on. A Christian. First, as soon as a person gets born again, the Holy Spirit moves into their spirit, and their spirit is born from above. Born. Born from above. Had no life, now it has life, and it's birthed into a whole new family. Your old man, your old family is crucified with Christ, and you are now birthed into a new family. I am no longer an Eddie. I am in the family of Jesus Christ. I am no longer Swedish, or half God, Swedish. No. Hallelujah. Talk about redemption, huh? I am now what? I am in the family of God. I have a father. I have Jesus is my brother, my co-heir. Oh, come on, man. We've got to understand that this has got to be deeper theology than just something out there in the, in the hinterland, something, okay? No, this has got to be practical. If you're not practically applying it, then it's a useless theology. Man, we are there. How does this work? My old man is crucified with Christ. I'm united with Jesus in his death, his burial, his resurrection. I am born of God. Everything is different. All things. If any man be in Christ, the old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As far as anything is concerned, everything changes right there because I have salvation in my spirit. Wow. Meaning what? Folks, I hear about little Daniel James, and it's a genetic problem. And I tell you, that doesn't affect me at all. It doesn't shock me. It doesn't hold me back. We don't give up saying, oh, it's a genetic deal. No, we can change genetics. Amen. Amen. Change them. We don't have to be stuck on those. And we're not the only ones that believe it. Now, they're starting to find out through this science community that genetics doesn't cut it. It doesn't mean that just because you have this in your genes that that's the way it's always going to be. Amen. Now they're finding out it's called epigenetics and they're showing that you can change genetic form. I love this stuff. Amen. 
Where did sin go? Sin moved into the body. The devil in the world has a direct connection to the sin that's in the body, which makes the choice in the will extremely important. We can choose to walk in the things of the Spirit and get life. I wish it was just that simple. To make one decision and go for it. Boy, that would be so cool. I found that to not necessarily be the case. But what happens if, as a Christian if I choose to walk in sin? Then the outcome is the same thing as any other sinner. Even though I have salvation in my spirit, I can still walk in death and produce death in those around me. Heavy, 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 heavy. Where's the heart? The heart is the connection between the soul and the spirit. That's where God has implanted in us by his spirit the desire to be, have the attributes of God. It all hangs right there to have the attributes that God intends us to have. But we have a problem. The things the spirit are supposed to make it into our soul, but because of hardness of heart, hardness of heart, which are calcifications on the bottom side of the heart. I don't know how else you want to put it. It's a hardness that comes on our side of the heart through two things, wounds and choices. Now, I'm going to say this blatantly and openly, and I'm just not going to apologize for it in any way, shape, or form. You have not been healed of the hurts that have been in your past yet. There's not a single one of us that is totally free of the hurts that we have in our past. And I'm telling you straight out and simple, you must start working on those harder. It came apparent to me again yesterday how many people are out there with all this stuff. And we get a semblance of freedom in a certain area of our life. And then we say, we're good to go. We're not good to go. You still haven't been totally freed. Understand that none of us have, including me. I'm not just throwing this out at you. This is true. I have got to continually be working on this hardness of heart. It is absolutely important. It's mandatory. And for those of you who have heard any of the end time stuff that has been brought lately, I'm going to hear, hear me out very strong. If it causes you to get into fear, it was the wrong message. It better not bring us into fear. It has got to bring us into, oh, wow, God's going to be working on this planet. And he's not going to work through anybody but his bride and his people. And we get the opportunity to see God himself working on this planet as Christ is formed in us. And we will see the things happen. Miracles, all these things. Do not get into fear. It ain't God if it's fear. We've got to understand that God is preparing us for a time like this for us to walk in the power of the joy of who he is making in us. And we're going to walk in the power of God like never before. We're going to see what has never been seen on this planet. And we are going to be part of it. And the vibrations and all these things that we've been learning are going to be manifesting in us to bring about things so we can bring life to those who are in such death. Amen. The things of the Spirit can't make it into my soul because of the hardness of heart in these areas. Can't make it. And I cannot see who I am. I can't see myself. My identity is blocked because of these hardness of hearts. Who are you? And I'll tell you something. If you've gotten mad at anybody recently, you have not dealt with your hardness of heart. If you've gotten mad, that means you don't know who you are. You're allowing somebody else's actions to dictate how you respond to that, and you don't know who you are in Christ. However, here's the deal. Every one of these hardness of hearts is what? That's a place where I'm filled with me. Every one of these hardness of hearts is an area where I'm filled with my selfishness. I'm filled with my focus of myself. Here's the deal. Any area in your life where you said, you can't tell me what to do. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Is an area where you have a hard heart. Any area where you are holding yourself saying, well, this is mine and I want to do this is a hard heart. Huh? Am I telling the truth or what? Okay. If you don't want to get up in the morning, even though you know you should, but you are, are saying, I want to sleep in this morning. When God is saying, you know, you need to be here at church on time to pray with us. It's hardness of heart. I'm not trying to shoot at any one person, okay? Folks, listen, we only have one time to pray together all week. One. It's 15 minutes at 930. 
We meet here as the body of Christ to pray for what happens here today. Do we really love this community enough to pray about what's happening in here so that the community will be affected by the draw of the Holy Spirit? If only what happened today happened only with what you prayed, then what would happen in this service today? Probably we would have nothing. Because if you didn't pray it into existence today, then your faith is that it will not be here, and that is what's affecting our body. We have got to be together in the unified body of Christ to do what God is calling us to do. Folks, he's calling us to get rid of our hardness of heart. We've been preaching this message now for years. Where should we be? Okay. If I can get the healing and forgiveness and the repentance and start dealing with the hardness of heart it softens and opens the heart and in those areas I can see the salvation of my spirit come into my soul see the salvation of my soul in those areas where I have been blocked now to be really honest there are areas that are already set free got the power of the spirit walking there but that is the truth when I got born again a lot of my soul got saved there's areas where I was open to him. It flowed into my soul. God has been changing our souls daily, working on these things, touching. We've got to give him credit for the beauty of what things he's done. But why are we stopped now? How much green is up there? Okay, we've got to deal with these hardness of hearts so we can bring the healing into the body, bring the body, soul, and spirit all under the power of God and bring that into worship. Folks, this is, is this important? Yes. This is a reality. What do we really want to do? And it isn't about doing the religion thing, about who's going to come at the end of the service for an altar call to get his act together on this. <laughs> this is what it is, is that the Spirit of God is touching us. We have got to make these decisions without religion to make it happen. If it requires church to make you change, you're not listening to him during the week. You're going to have to listen. You're going to have to listen. Okay? Well, then last week we started talking about Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, how this is the person of the Godhood, and that there are three times it says God is, God is light, God is love, and God is spirit, and these are the attributes of God. They go every direction. The Spirit is light, the Jesus is love, spirit, light. It doesn't matter. They spin. But the manifestation of them, okay, glory is the manifestation of light, grace is the manifestation of love, and the anointing is the manifestation of the Spirit, except the problem is that these manifestations also spin. The manifestation of light is the anointing, the manifestation of grace is under the Spirit. Okay, there's no way you can just block those in. They're there. That's the way they are. Can you grow in them? Yes. How do you grow in them? You grow in them by faith. And by faith is how you get all of them to fly. But we've learned that there's something else. Faith is true. It's not wrong. But I'm going to submit something else that is just as strong. How do you grow in all of this? That's the filling. That's what I'm getting rid of me and filling me with him is how all this happens. That's how the anointing flows. That's how I grow in grace when I realize his grace in more areas in my life. This is how the glory happens when I get rid of the areas where I don't see who I am and I get rid of those. Then I can see that I am the glory of the Lord in the mirror. Any of these scriptures come to mind? You're, you're getting these? I've got to know who I am. This is where it is. It's in the filling. I think the filling is the biggest thing the Lord has delivered in our direction for a very long time. Knowing what revelation he's given over the last while, that's saying a lot. Isn't it? Powerful. Okay. Prophet, priest, and king. The three things in the Old Testament that were anointed for office. Anointed to go in their place. Prophet, priest, and king. That's the anointing. The prophet was anointed to witness. The priest was anointed to worship and to minister to God. The king was anointed for warfare, administration, to do those kinds of things. Well, this is the same anointings. Jesus had all three, prophet, priest, and king. He was the anointed one. He had them all, which is amazing. 
These people in the Old Testament were empowered by an outside force. However, now in the New Testament, we have a difference because we're now empowered by an inside force. My anointing for me to worship comes from the inside, not the outside. But how much will I worship is determined on how filled I am. How well you worship is dependent upon how much of the Holy Spirit is filling you. Because your soul will not dance before people because you're afraid of what people will think. But the laying down of your soul, the humbling yourself, the crucifixion of your flesh makes it so it doesn't matter who thinks what's going on. It doesn't matter. Well, I don't dance very pretty. Well, neither do I. Obviously, my daughters will tell you that on a regular basis. Okay? My other thing is, so what? I'm not dancing for you anyway. You're Eve's watching. <laughs> Isn't that, no? Isn't that the word? I don't know what that's called. It's... Uh, <laughs> Okay, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for him. But I'll tell you something. I don't care if I dance pretty or not. I just don't care anymore. So what if people see me in a holy dance with Jesus? I'm hoping it sparks in them a desire to have a relationship with him like they've never had. The anointing. It's not trained flesh. It's not trusting in self. It's not talent or personal style. It's not a badge of spirituality. Come on, we've heard all this. This is, this is how we, oh, they're anointed. No, they're talented. There's a difference between talented and anointed. I can't even remember where I saw this guy, but we were somewhere, and the lights went out, and they had no power for the band, no power for amplifiers, no power for microphones, no power for keyboards, power went out and all we were left with was one acoustic guitar and one guy sitting down front and he sat down without any music because he couldn't see it and he sat down and out of his memory with his legs crossed just sat there just started playing the old hippie style of just sitting there playing an acoustic guitar and worshiping and it was the deepest worship I've ever experienced and he was bad. He missed chords. He couldn't sing. But he worshipped. It's not something to glorify you. It's not pride. But it's confidence that knowing is God going to work. Man is as powerful. Okay. We went over Luke 16 through 17, 16, the whole passage here. And Jesus came to Nazareth where he was brought up, and he, as was his custom, he went in the day of the Sabbath into the synagogue. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed him, and unrolling the book, he found the place where it was written. Now this is all after he was baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit came on him, and he was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And you know what I've determined with that? The, ba the baptism in water, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he went out in the wilderness to fast for 40 days and 40 nights so that he would know his filling. Because it had nothing to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit for him touching others. There was nobody else out there but Satan. And he wasn't ministering to Satan. What was he doing? He was laying down his soul. He was, con he was dis disciplining himself. He was filling, making sure he had the filling of the Holy Spirit. He came back here, and now he says, hi there. He did this. Everything was normal, but things were about to change. He had done this before, and immediately he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because of this. He has anointed me to proclaim the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim remission to the captives and blind to see again, to send away the ones being crushed in remission, to preach an acceptable year of the Lord. And Jesus had an anointing for something here. It was specific and it was recounted. And he said, this is what my anointing is to do. Now, you notice what he said. He was baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with the Spirit. He's coming and says, here's my anointing. He's taking it on. Our anointing is his through us. Now, we'll, we'll look at that verse again in just a second. 
But it says, and rolling up the scroll, returning it to the attendant, he sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your ears. And all bore witness to him, marveling at the gracious words coming out of his mouth and saying, Wait a minute. Isn't this the son of Joseph? Something had changed. Wow, something drastic. They didn't catch what he said at first. But they knew something was different. And then Jesus said to them, He said to them, Undoubtedly, now, they didn't say anything. He's not responding to them. He's just, I mean, he is responding. He's just, he read this, he sat down, and he says this. He said to them, Undoubtedly, you will speak this parable to me, physician, heal yourself. What things we heard were happening in Capernaum, which he hadn't done a single thing in Capernaum yet. This is all prophecies, looking ahead. Do also here in your fatherland. But he said, Truly, I say to you that no prophet is acceptable in his fatherland. But truthfully, I will say to you, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up over three years and six months, when a great famine came upon all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to Zarephath of Sidon to a widow woman. And many lepers were in Israel during the time of Elisha the prophet. None of them were made clean except Naaman the Syrian. Wow. He says, Now, the anointing is going to be here, but it's only going to be for those who are looking for it? Anointing isn't indiscriminate. It doesn't just flow. He says, oh, it's only going to happen to those. He could not do major works in Nazareth because of their unbelief. unbelief. Wow. Only function for specific situations. And that's what he says. This is what I'm called to do in these things. They realized at that point what he was saying. He slammed them hard. So I just want to let you know it's not going to happen here. So then verse 38, 28 to 30, it says, And all were filled with anger. They were what? Filled. Oh. And see, (laughs) Jesus was filled of the Spirit. And what were they filled with? Anger. Anger. Selfishness. It's all about them. They were filled with anger, hearing these things in the synagogue. And rising up, they threw him outside the city. (laughs) And led them up to the brow of the hill on which their city was built in order to throw him down. But he, he went away, passing through their midst. They were offended. They were ticked. (laughs) Should we teach the message on offense again? Yeah, we probably need it again, don't we? We aren't worthy of the anointing? They were all sorts of upset. What? You're saying that you've got all this anointing and you're not going to do it here? We're not worthy? You're not good enough? We're not? We're inadequate? You just hear all that's going on in their heart. Extreme response. So they grabbed him and threw him out of the city, and they were going to throw him over the, the cliff. Now, this is Nazareth. This is what it looks like. Okay? Uh, I don't know if I took this or Kimberly took this, but we took this little picture. There's Nazareth. But I know that Kimberly took this picture because that's me. Okay? And I'm standing on the cliff edge that they were going to try to throw him off of. He was right there. And then he just walked through their midst. How did he do that? Oh, I, I know what I think. I think he just sped up his molecules. I think it's all vibrations. I think he just walked through them. They couldn't find him. Just, <laughs> he just changed up. Uh, folks, do we know what we're talking about when we start talking about physics and epiphysics? We better figure it out. Now, here's, that was all review. You ready for the new stuff? Strap in. The focus of the anointing in Luke, in that passage was in Luke. Here's what that scripture said. I have been anointed to proclaim the gospel to the poor. Heal the brokenhearted. Proclaim remission to captives or freedom to captives. Sight to the blind. Crushed ones are sent away in remission. And proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, isn't this fun? This is what he said. This is what he read. He quoted that, rolled it up, and handed it in and said, this is now fulfilled in your ears. This is what he's looking at. Now, go ahead and look at everything he did from that time to the time he was crucified. And what did he do? He proclaimed the gospel to the poor. What's the gospel for? The poor? The gospel is good news Who's the poor? Those that don't have something. What's the gospel? What's the good news? To those who don't have something, I have it for you. Good news is something's going to be changed. Heal the brokenhearted. Man, proclaim remission to captives, those people in captivity. Sight to the blind. Crush when sent away in remission. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Let's go to Isaiah 61. 
We're going to go right to the passage that he read, and we're going to examine them together. Do a little comparison here. <laughs> Isaiah 61.1 says, and it starts off, The Spirit of the Lord Yahweh is on me, because Jehovah has anointed me to preach the gospel to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and complete opening to the bound ones. This is what Jesus was reading. It was kind of fascinating, preaching the gospel to the meek. Preach the gospel. Fresh, full, cheerful. This is what it's talking about. But it's funny. It's only one word. The word preach is not in there. The word gospel is not in there. What is it? It's one word that is... I'm going to go out and gospelize. I'm going to good news you. Okay? <laughs> I think that's fascinating. To the meek. Who's the meek? Look it up in your little dictionary, and it says depressed in mind or circumstances. Poor works. Not just meek. It's poor. Depressed in mind or circumstances. Interesting. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Have you ever been depressed in any circumstance, situation? Have your finances depressed, pushed down? I got an answer for you. His name is Jesus. The only anointing that's going to get your finances set free is Him. Yeah. Depressed in emotions? I've got good news for you. Your emotions can be healed. How? Only in Jesus not going to find this in any other way. Now, is there some help out there? Sure. You can be feeling better. There's help out there. It does neat stuff. Really good things. But I'll tell you something. Real freedom only comes from Him. And don't work too well for broken yeah, that's what I hear. So this job was poured onto Him or into Him. I don't know how you... Just, he got the pouring of this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's on. It's poured. It's the anointing. It's poured. But here we're going to go. We're going to break down some of these. Bind the brokenhearted. Bind the brokenhearted. In Luke, it said, heal the brokenhearted. I'm here to heal the brokenhearted. But here, it says to dress up a wound for healing. So what's the big difference? See, there's not much of a difference. Okay? Somebody has a gash in their arm, and I take a dressing, and I wind it around him, and I hold and it. It stops the bleeding. It keeps out infection. It does everything, and that wound is taken care of. The wound is taken care of. Okay? Heal the brokenhearted. Heal this thing. Is it healed? Is it wound up, bound up? Okay, all of it works together to me. I don't know. What's it going to take? I've found in face-to-face -face ministry that some people are healed instantly of an issue, and some, as they walk it out, the healing of their soul comes. Okay? I think it's both. Both works for me. Broken heart. In Hebrew, it's the word heart, leb, but the word in front of it is shabar, and it means to burst, to break. To cr just, it's broken. A broken heart, just broken. But in the Greek, it's the word that means to be shattered and crushed. Broken, shattered, crushed. Kind of gives an idea of the picture behind it. I don't see a big difference here. Heal the brokenhearted. To those whose hearts have been crushed, broken, battered, aren't working right, that's every area of the hardness of heart that we have had. These are areas where God has the anointing to change your broken heart. All these areas where our heart has been broken, now Jesus has for us the ability to change that. What God has done is He has given to us an understanding of the revelation on how to bring this kind of healing to the heart. I got to tell you something. I am stoked about this. You talk about a privilege. We've been handed this amazing thing to be able to walk into somebody's life and take their heart that has been totally broken and by the anointing of Jesus Christ, getting them to come close to him, getting them in the same proximity with him and watch him heal their broken heart. The anointing is there for that. And man, we are part of that. We should be, oh, we should be freaking out right about now. Yay. 
The heart is not functional as it was created to be, therefore we're bringing something to it. They are cursed against their identity. Cursed against their identity. They don't know who they are. Listen, as soon as you become the wounded, what's your identity? The wounded. How many times have we dealt with people whose identity is being a victim? Okay, it's all the time. They've been hurt, so now their identity is, I am the one who was hurt. That's their identity. Wow. How about you? Totally selfish. But it's all about the focus about me. And listen, people, we, we talk to people who've been hurt by people. Wow. Nasty. Am I against the people that got hurt? No, I'm not against them. I want them to understand until they get rid of their desire to keep their pain and all the benefits they get with it, they're not going to be healed. Then it says, proclaim liberty to the captives. But this is kind of fascinating. Both passages, liberty, liberty, freedom, it's there. Spirit, soul, and body. This is what's really kind of fun for me. It's not just getting them saved so their spirit is better. There's more to it than that. He was there to, to get them liberty to the captives. Where are you captivated? Wherever it is that you're captivated is where he's going to bring you the liberty. That's the anointing. Where are you captivated? Well, that's what makes this fun, the word captives. In Hebrew, it means one who has been carried into captivity. And in Greek, it means a prisoner of war. I don't see a lot of difference there. Carried into captivity or a prisoner of war? Have you ever been held captive by what the enemy has done? Yeah. See, every time you listen to the enemy, what are you doing? You're being held captive as a prisoner of war. <laughs> I don't know about... See, this, this, just, this just sparks me because it makes me want to get more ministry into people who need it. It just reminds me of why God did what he did to bring this to us. Taken captive by others. Is there anybody that's been taken captive by others? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. It says proclaim liberty to captives. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say bring liberty to captives. What's, okay. What could that be? The difference between proclaim and bring? Mm -hmm. I, the picture that comes to my mind is the picture of the soldiers who came into Auschwitz and they came into the places. They came in and proclaimed, you are no longer captives. Along with it comes everything that goes with it. Okay. We're going to walk them out. We're going to bring them healing. We're going to bring them food. Okay. We're going to bring them all the things they need. But you are no longer under the captivity. Okay. Yeah. Freedom to be who they are. I, I, the pictures, I don't know if anybody, have, any of you have ever been to the Holocaust museums. Okay. I've not been to the one in New York, but I happen to be the one in Jerusalem. New, or is it New, or it's D.C. Okay, I'm sorry. D.C. Not been to that one, obviously, because I don't even know where it is. <laughs> but I've been to the one in Jerusalem. What a solemn place. What a solemn place. That's what bothers me. It's a solemn place. Wait a minute. Yeah, to understand that it did happen, that's solemn. But to understand that they were released... And that it did come to an end. Should be a celebration, shouldn't it? Do you know how many Christians were killed? See, we, don't, we think about the six million Jews. Do you know how many Christians were killed? Okay. Wow. The understanding, folks. But here's the deal. So they killed a Christian. So they sent multiplied millions of Christians to be home with Jesus. Is that a holocaust? That's a huge graduation. But see, that's the problem, is in the Jews, there is no hope. They still, even after they left, they were still captives. And you just torture, and you look at them, they have the tattoos on their arms, and they say, I am a holocaust survivor. That was their identity. Is that who you are? No, that's what happened to you. Who are you? Oh, man, it takes the freedom in Christ to bring us into this identity deals. We've got more than that. Now, what's going to happen? Truthful, read your Bible. 
What's going to happen in Revelation? There will be open persecution of Christians in the United States. How much persecution? Camps? Yeah. Rounding them up? Yes. Murdering them? Absolutely. Killing Christians in the streets will happen. I don't know. It just sounds like, you know, well, Lee, you're such a doom and gloomer. No. No, 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 no. I said, if the end time message brings you into fear, you're getting the wrong message. Is it going to happen? Yes. What's going to happen to all these Christians? Instantly into the very presence of God. And you see all these who are dressed in white robes and they're under the altar and they're crying out, Lord, how long? And he says, hang on, the number is not complete yet, but on you there will be no heat. There'll be no problems. He personally took care of them. He wants them blessed. Wow! If we're all nervous about persecution, folks, all that means is you get to go home earlier than somebody else. What does the other mean? I get to see. I don't know when I'm going to die. I don't know. But boy, what I'm going to see before that happens. I want to bring all the power of God into this darkness. I want to see what it's like to be the glow worm in this whole thing. Okay? Proclaiming liberty. Folks, we already have the liberty. We get to proclaim it to others who are in captivity. Why should a Christian be in any port of captivity? We shouldn't. It doesn't matter if they put you in irons and clap you against a wall. You're still not in captivity. Then it says next, complete opening to bound ones. All of a sudden, Watson, the game is afoot. Why? Why? Because now we've got a difference. Now there's a mystery between what was spoken in Luke and what was written in Isaiah. Now this is a problem. This is what people say. See the Bible discrepancies. See. Okay. Well, what's going on here? Luke gives two phrases and Isaiah only gives one. Hmm. Did Jesus read it correctly? Did Luke write it from memory and miss it? Was Luke even there? No. At the beginning, there was no disciples there. He had heard it back, but he knew that he'd quoted from Isaiah chapter 61. 1. Okay, so did Luke just write this from memory and just add this in? <laughs> I love this. Everybody go. Oh, you stirred up my mystery thing. Oh, what's wrong with you? Okay, let's look at this. In the Hebrew, it's pechak kowach. That's as close as I can get it. It is the Greek word pochach, redoubled. In other words, it says it like it says it twice. It doubles the meaning. And the meaning is to open, especially the eyes, to make one observant. So complete open to the bound ones to bring sight to the blind... It's the same thing. To give them opening and sight to the blind is the same thing. Sight to the blind both ways. Physical sight to those who are physically blind and opening, an opening to those who are bound. Sight the other direction. Opening in their soul. I think this is fascinating. But there is and or another explanation. This is, kind of, this is so fun for me. I say and or because I can't sit, just sit and pick which one. Okay, how did it? It was is it pakakoak redoubled kind of a thing? Yes, it is. And there's something else. <laughs> they inserted Isaiah 42 six through seven in a quoting of this, very possibly because watch this. Isaiah 42 six through seven says this: I Yahweh Jehovah, whatever name you want to say there. And again, there has been a lot of speculation about this name. What is his name? God. Okay. Jesus. Okay. The Tetragrammaton says it's Y H W H. Nobody knows how to pronounce it. Nobody. So the people that are saying it Yahweh, Yahweh, Yah, Yahoo, I don't know. Okay. None of us know how to pronounce it. We will know at one point. We will know as God declares his name. But here's the issue that's still in the Hebrew. Still in the Hebrew. I don't speak Hebrew. I do speak in English. And it is translated into the English when they first did it 
Jehovah. And they took vowels and threw it in there because there's no vowel points in the, they just did the, the straight consonants. There's no vowel points. Nobody knows how it's pronounced. So it doesn't matter. I do speak English. The English name is Jehovah, and it's only used in the Old Testament. When it gets to the New Testament, what's he called? God. 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 And that's the only other term, is he's the Father. Okay? What's his name? We will know it, just like we will know our name. Is his name Jesus, or is it Yeshua? Yes. Yeshua is the Hebrew I don't speak Hebrew. I do speak English. His name is Jesus. Is there a problem with his name being called Jesus? No. When you go down south of the border, it's Jesus. Okay? And yeah, El Señor is the Lord. Okay? You get into Russia, it's Jesus. Okay? Gospod is the Lord. Okay? His name is whatever language you're in call him by, listen, I'm in my office, I call him Jesus all the time, he responds and loves it, yes. right, because it's not about that, don't get hung up on this, I just want to make sure, because there's going to be an awful lot of push for religious yes. whatever, um, I'm not, I'm not concerned about that, I know, it says, I Jehovah have called you, he's talking about Jesus, this is messianic, I Jehovah have called you in righteousness, and will hold your hand, and will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people, for a light of the nations to open blind eyes, to lead out the prisoner from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison. Wow, totally about Jesus, messianic. It's all about the same thing. But here's the beautiful thing. It adds the covenant to the equation. And I thought, wait a minute. This is really wild. So Jesus is the anointed one, and he's the one that's covenant of the nations. Who are we in covenant with? Are you just convinced who you're in covenant with? You are in covenant by the blood of Jesus Christ. He was our representative when he and the Father walked the path, right? And they are in covenant, and we are in him. Who are we in? Christ, the anointed one. How much anointing do we get? This is how we get the anointing, is because we are in covenant with the anointed one. And all that he has is mine, and all that I have is his. We're still back in the, in the covenant. Amen. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Why does the blood of the lamb overcome the accuser? Because we're in covenant with the lamb. And he can't affect the lamb. That's right. Aye, aye, aye. Got it. Covenant is living for the other person. The death of independent living. The anointed one lives through me. Wow, is that cool. Is that deep? I love this. This just sparks me up. But I tell you. Done by relationship with Jesus. Now, there's even another explanation, possibly. Oh, are we having fun yet? I like all this mystery stuff, okay? This is fun. Another explanation is how it was translated into the Greek. What? Well, you see, Luke wrote and spoke in Greek. Luke was not Jewish. He was not an Israeli. Oh, now this is interesting. He wrote and spoke in Greek. The Septuagint, the Old Testament, translated into Greek, was written 300 years earlier. Now, this is very interesting because much of the quotes of the New Testament in the New Testament are from the Septuagint. Why? Because they only had one Greek Bible, and they all had it, and they quoted from it. Now, what's fascinating is the author, or the translators, the 70, there were 70 scholars in Alexandria who were given the, the task of translating the Hebrew into the Greek. That's why they call it the Septuagint, because there were 70 of them. Septuagint, 70 things. Okay. In Isaiah, back, back, sit, stay. Okay, the 
understanding here is so much of the New Testament, when they quote the Old Testament and they went to write it down, they wrote it right out of the Old Testament Greek. How fascinating. Well, what's fascinating is when you got the Pekakowak, how do you translate it? It's redoubled. So how they translate it? Opening of the bound ones and sight to the blind. Hmm. How else would you translate it? If you're going to translate that it's redoubled. Isn't that fun? See? I see. In the Septuagint, it is quoted as, and it gives both. Opening and sight to the blind. In the Septuagint. Okay, it's all this whole thing wrapped up together. Now, if that's the anointing that Jesus has, right? Is that the anointing? That's the anointing, because Jesus says, this is the anointing that's come on me to do this. And what does he do? Yeah, see, Greg's laughing because he knows where I'm heading with this thing. It's your anointing. This is what God has called you to do, is to bring opening to the bound ones, sight to the blind. It's your anointing. Whose anointing? Your anointing. You are anointed as Jesus is. What's the problem? The problem is, is how filled are you with Christ? How filled are you with selfishness versus how filled you are with the Spirit? It's as much as you are filled with the anointing is how much the anointing is able to walk out. It's how much of Christness we have filling us with what's the anointing that will go out of us. Right. And I'll tell you, if all we're doing is focusing on our selfishness, how much are we going to pour out for somebody else? It's just not going to happen. Verse 2 says, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now, Jesus stopped right after the first phrase. He stopped reading. All this anointing, and he says, and to preach or proclaim the acceptable day of the Lord, and he rolled up the scroll. What? What? Okay. Why? Why? Because he was proclaiming the change had come for the acceptable year of the Lord. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Isn't that cool? He's proclaiming that. Really cool. But the day of vengeance was not what he was coming to tell them yet. Okay, now here's where the problem lies. Not the problem, the beauty. I don't know. The anointing is still to talk about the day of vengeance. The day of vengeance is coming. Okay? Now, we have an anointing, which is the anointing that the Christ has, to proclaim an acceptable year of the Lord. It is still time to be saved. People can still get saved today. But there is the day of vengeance also coming. And we will be as anointed to preach the day of vengeance as we are to preach the acceptable day of the Lord. And then the rest of all this is absolutely needed. The rest of what is coming on is really needed to be preached. And then it says, to comfort all who mourn. Now this just ties us right into the Beatitudes. Do you remember the Beatitudes? We went over those kind of tightly. Blessed are those who mourn. Why? For they shall be comforted. Wow. To comfort all who mourn. He's bringing them the understanding that, hey, if you're mourning, there is comfort. Okay? Till to this day, it still amazes me. I hear people talking about their fathers and their mothers, and, and this person died, and this person died. To this day, I still don't have a normal sense of mourning for my parents. I have never had a hard time with their death. They died. They're not here. So, they're in heaven. I'm a little wee bit jealous. But I got to watch my dad walk into heaven and shake hands with Jesus. So, I, there's... <laughs> ah, turkey, he's happy. He's taken care of. There is no mourning for me. It's not there. There is no mourning for my mom. She finally just released and went home to Jesus. It was so cool. And I look back and go, they're not going to have to go through all this end time stuff. They're at home with Jesus. Them, I tell you, critters. Okay? However, 
when my dog died. <laughs> it messed me up. It messed me up. I still to this day, talking about it, there's emotion there. I've brought this to the Lord so many times. Why did my dog dying mess me up? My parents dying didn't. That sounds so weird. Nah, now if you understand, there is nothing about my dog going to be in heaven. It was a loss to me. It was gone. It's done. It's gone. I know the difference between the hope of my parents. There's no mourning. There's no need. I've been comforted in that. It's a, it's a big deal. My parents are fine. They're happy. Okay? The revelation of face-to-face -face healing is to what? To comfort all who mourn. I don't care what it is you've gone through. We can bring you the comfort of this. Let's go and talk to Jesus about it. Let's bring you face-to-face -to, -face to who he is. And you'll find the comfort. Verse 3. And this goes on and says, To appoint to those who mourn in Zion... To give them beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of infirmity, so that one calls them trees of righteousness, the planting of Jehovah, in order to beautify himself. Woo! To a point for those to, who mourn in Zion. What in the world? Now, if you don't know what Zion is, it makes life kind of a tricky deal. Where is Zion? There's a Mount Zion in Jerusalem. That's a mountain. It's a place where the Temple Mount is. It's all right there. What is Zion? See, Zion has been stolen by the Zionists. I'm not a Zionist of this realm. All the people who are doing their Zion, you know, Zion things in Israel right now, that's not Zion. Who is Zion? Those who are washed under the blood of Jesus Christ is Zion. To give them a place, appoint those who mourn in Zion. I can go in the place of Zion and find absolute comfort. This is awesome. Now there's all sorts of prophecies about Zion and different things. That's all going to be fun and that's, that's cool. However, here's the deal. We can, by the anointing, bring people into where they will be safe in Zion. That's the beauty of it. Where is it? It's a place where the washing of the Lamb dedicates them, brings them in, changes them, brings them into the close walk with God. To give them beauty instead of ashes. I love that. How do the people in the Middle East mourn with ashes? What do they do? They throw ashes and all that, just like, no, no, no. Beauty instead of ashes. How do you see yourself? We saw a lady yesterday. All her life, all her life, she thought she was ugly. All her life. She judged herself as ugly. She sat in a demonstration in front of God and everybody <laughs> and sat there and forgave herself for these things and then came to Jesus and said, Lord, would you forgive me for being ugly? And the Lord said, I have never seen you as ugly. And Bruce was doing this to her and he looked at her and says, what does never mean? <laughs> That was an awesome line, man. I was going, Bruce, all right. <laughs> I have never, Jesus said, I have never seen you as ugly. Is she ugly? See, it doesn't matter who in the planet thinks she's ugly. Her creator says, I've never seen you as ugly. You're my beauty. What did we do? We gave her beauty instead of ashes. That's what's open to all of us. Anybody here think you're ugly? Man, all you have to do is just go to Jesus and find out. Listen, I, I'm not Clark Gable. I'm not Guy Williams. I'm not any of these guys that have just... I brought up a good name there. I'm sorry. I, just, I know that, but I'll tell you something. I wouldn't trade faces with them. Walked into Safeway just... Was it yesterday, day before? Yeah, yesterday? Walked in, and there's a new Life magazine sitting there, and it has Sean Connery sitting there with his gun. 
50 years of James Bond. Now, that would be a fun magazine to read. Okay, that's fun. But there's Sean Connery. All you have to do is bring up the name Sean Connery and Roxy's mother starts drooling. Okay, it's just kind of funny. Just bring him up. Just talk about him. Right? Okay. I'm not Sean Connery, but I'll tell you something. I wouldn't take, I wouldn't trade faces with any of them. Why? This is the one God gave me, and I can do anything with this face. Uh -huh. I can express with this face. This face works for me, and I'm glad that I am not the most handsome guy on the planet because I don't have to deal with a lot of stuff and falter all about all these women fainting over you, whatever. I don't need that. I've got the most awesome wife on the planet. As long as she thinks I'm fine enough looking, then I'm a happy man, you know. Now that I've fixed my hair. Okay. The anointing, how about this one? The oil of joy instead of mourning. Notice how much there is against mourning. The oil of joy. If you're afraid of what's going to happen, that people are going to die, this is the oil of joy instead of mourning. We have got to get rid of this mourning thing. We are going to lose friends. There are people in this room who will die a martyr's death. The oil of joy instead of mourning. Folks, I like this idea of the oil of joy. Remember we've been talking about the oil of anointing, how it just gets over everything? Well, if I get joy, it's amazing how much I can spread it around. It just oozes all over everybody. I like it. The oil of joy instead of mourning. Then it says, the garment of praise, the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of infirmity. Wow. This is identity. What do you put on? You putting on your infirmity? Is that how you see yourself as sick? Is that how you see yourself as infirm? Is that how you see yourself as having all these problems? Oh, man, it's time to take off the, the mantle or the garment of infirmity, weakness, and junk, and crud, and put on the mantle, the garment of praise, and change your identity. That's what the whole thing face-to-face -face does is changes identity. So that one calls them the trees of righteousness, the planting of Jehovah in order to beautify himself. Wow, the trees of righteousness. For a person, cursed is the man who trusts in man, makes flesh his strength, and turns his heart away from Jehovah, because he's a shrub in the desert who can't see when good comes, but he lives in a wilderness, in a parched land, in the salt land, which is uninhabited. But blessed is the man who trusts in Jehovah, and Jehovah is his refuge, for he is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, sends out its roots in the stream, will not fear when he comes, but will always have green leaf, will not be anxious at an entire year of drought, but will never cease yielding fruit. God, that's good. What's it going to happen? It's the planting of Jehovah. It's called trees of righteousness. Everybody that looks at us will say, wow, that's the planting of Jehovah. It's not my planting. It's his, him touching me, making it better. Wow, that's amazing. Verse 4. And by the way, a part that he may beautify himself, we're ornaments on him. He calls us so beautiful. He, orna he uh, dresses himself up with us. You think you're ugly? No, you're not ugly. And it says, and they shall build old ruins, bad marriages, old lives, all that junk and crud. And they shall raise up the former desolations, making homes fit for life again. And they shall restore the waste cities, communities of life instead of communities of death. Ruins of generations and generations, destroying the curse of generations. What's your anointing? What's your anointing? See, this is, this, is it, this is it. Building old ruins. Things have been torn down by all the junk and crud. You're going to rebuild so that they're not junk and crud anymore. They shall raise up former desolations. What was desolation is now life. That's your anointing to do in somebody else's life. And they shall restore the waste cities. Now, what's the revelation of this church? Is that we are a city to be dwelt in. Psalms 107. A safe place of dwelling. A, a place of dwelling. This is, we're building, these are the waste cities. We do not have a dead church. You ever been in a dead church? I don't like that. 
Why? I want to have a, a place of life. It's not a waste city. It's a city of beauty, restored. Ruins of generations and generations are changed. We watched a guy yesterday, we just in a demonstration to show him how to break the curse of generations. And he had four names. His name, or his dad's name, his mother's name, then his wife, because he had covenant with her, her maiden name, her father's name, and her mother's name. Those are the four names that represent their family of Adam. And I says, okay, we're just talking, we're just declaring, I am saved, I am washed in the blood of Jesus, I've been united with Jesus, and all this sort of stuff. And I, I told him, he says, just say, I renounce the curse of the Smith family. And he says, I renounce the curse of the Smith family. Boom! Instantly, he was in the depth of of emotion all over as all the curses of his family were being lifted off of him. And he was no longer under their oppression. Wow. What did we get to do yesterday? Fulfill the anointing to build up the ruins of generations and generations. And what happened? We restored one man to the point where none of the curse of the generations was on him so that he was building his family in the right direction. It took five minutes Verses 5 through 6. And foreigners shall stand and flee, feed your flocks, and the sons of strangers shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers, and you shall be called priests of Jehovah. It will be said of you, ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and you shall revel in their glory. <laughs> I think we need revelation of this verse. Isn't this? Wow. Called priests of Jehovah. Called. This is what makes this really wild. Priests representing God. And it says, they, all these other people that are out there, are calling you priests of God. That means they must be able to see it. Mm. Ministers of the anointing. Wow. Favor of God. You'll eat the wealth of the nations and you shall revel in their glory. Powerful. Verse 7. Instead of your shame and disgrace, you get double. Anybody here ever lived under shame? How would you like to rather have the double? Uh -huh. They rejoice in their portion. No shame and no disgrace. They rejoice in their portion, for they shall possess a second time in their land. Now, is this talking about going to the land of Israel? No. What does it say? They shall possess a second time in their land. What? The things that God has given them, they're going to repossess it so that the possession of it is done correctly. Anybody here have a house? Wouldn't it be neat if that house was completely under the hand of God instead of under your hand? To be set free so much that everything you own is now under the real possession of how God can use it under you. Too cool. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. I like this. 8 and 9 says, For I, Jehovah, love judgment, hating plunder and burnt offerings. That should tell us something right there. God hates religion. I, Jehovah, love judgment, hating plunder and burnt offerings. I will give their work in truth. I will cut an everlasting covenant for them. There it is. The covenant again. And their seed shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed that Jehovah has blessed. External evidence of the blessing in our lives. This is what the anointing does for us. 10 and 11. Rejoicing, I will rejoice in Jehovah. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he clothed me with garments of salvation. There's identity. He put on me the robe of righteousness. There's identity. Even as a bridegroom dons as a priest his headdress. You wonder how come I can keep telling men, the, the heads of their homes, that they're the priests of their homes? There it is. Even as a bridegroom dons as a priest his headdress. He takes on his priesthood. And as a bride wears her ornaments. For as the earth comes out with her buds, and as a garden causes that which is sown to grow up, so the Lord Jehovah will make righteousness and praise to grow before all the nations. What is this? This is the outcome of what happens when we spread out the anointing. And we start walking in this. All this happens. This is too awesome. Isn't that an amazing chapter? That's it. 11 verses. 
Isaiah 61. What do we need to be walking in? Here's the part I want to really bring back to our mind. Christ living in and through me. He is fulfilling his life's purpose. People say, well, I want to fulfill my life's purpose. Your life's purpose is to fulfill his life's purpose. You will be fulfilled when you fulfill Christ. I get the honor of having this in my life. Wow. I must let him work his work first in me. Here's the thing. I can't bring the anointing to bring the healing to Alyssa until I first have allowed the healing to come in me. I have nothing to give her if I walk in my flesh. So it's my love for Alyssa should make me change who I am. Sure. When it works first in me, then I can do it into others. That's a good idea, isn't it? It's all about his love for me and therefore through me. It's about his love for me. In any area where you have a hardness of heart, any area where you have a hardness of heart is a place where you don't know he loves you. But I am hurt. You don't know he loves you in the hurt. Do we know his love? All for love. He gave it all for love. Traded the stars above. He gave it all for love. Where am I willing to let him go? Kind of the issue, isn't it? Because the highest purpose a person could have is to be the one to house and carry Jesus and release his anointing. Okay? We can be used to do mighty things to others. We can be. We can be used to do mighty things to others. The anointing is available. Then why haven't we seen it working? Because we're not dealing with the hardness of heart. Where is Jesus willing to go? But see, how much is he willing to use you? He's willing to use us, but until we are tying up our willingness to his willingness, it won't happen. If I am willing to let him, his anointing will take me where I never knew I could go. Have you ever thought about raising the dead? I have. I've spent long, long hours thinking about that. Really. It's, it's a consuming thought. I really want to see the dead raised. I want to see the dead raised. Now, see, you got to know, this is a fascination. I, I don't know how all this works. Have you ever seen the, the little film called Faith Like Potatoes? That poor guy, bless his little pointed little head, he went and this woman had died. And he, if you think it was his faith that raised her, it wasn't, because he was so freaked out that it happened. He, wanted, he was going to call the coroner. He was going to call the coroner. He went in, and they're all pressuring him. His is all peer pressure is the only reason he went in, because they're all pressuring him. You're the man of God, raise her. <laughs> he went in and picked her up by her arms, by her hands, like this. She's dead. She's dead. He let go, and she looked up at him. Ah! <laughs> she's still standing, and she's alive. Now, that just has got to... And you know the Lord is in the corner of the room just slapping his knee, going, <laughs> This is so cool! This will learn him! Boy, I just think that's a... <laughs> yeah, somebody's going to hit the floor. It's not her. It's uh, me. <laughs> okay. You carry the Holy Spirit on this planet. Do we let him fill us? It's not enough to have him in your spirit. We've got to get him in our soul. We've got to get that filling. Okay, was that enough for the day? I know I'm, I'm getting to preachy here. I'm getting a little bit more preachy than teachy, okay? But I think there's a reason. 
Guys, we've got to. If we're going to touch this community, it's got to be because we are already living it. Okay? We're going to bring us that. What is the anointing? Are you going to let the anointing out so you can bring to them beauty instead of ashes? The oil of joy instead of the, the mantle of heaviness? Mantle of infirmity? Wow. Are you ready to take to them a proclamation that the captives can be set free and that their eyes can be opened up? We have a short window of time to do all this. We need to get after it. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, today. I praise you. Lord, how much we need to have your Spirit fill us. How much we need to know that we are your anointed ones. Lord, we need you. Lord, you need to convict us of areas where we don't want to let go. Show us where we need to be healed. Show us where our selfishness rules and reigns. Show us in the areas where we get all whiny and nitpicky. Lord, show us how to die to our selfishness that we can live in you. Lord, we've got to learn this now before it's absolutely mandatory and forced upon us. Lord, show us. We just give you the glory for all of this in Jesus precious and holy name. Amen. Go with God. Be anointed.